All right, well, here we are once again. We're starting a little later today, but um, we should uh, still be uh, able, for those of you who are watching, most of you are watching this uh, uh, recorded version, so it should be the same, same length as before. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of a new day, the gift of a new, a new day living for you. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us as a virtual neighborhood. Help us to truly love one another, to love our neighbor as ourself, to be able to respect one another, especially those who are different than us to be able to always live out truth and charity together. We pray glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we have, I believe, three more chapters. So I think what we're going to do so we're gonna do today and then we're gonna we're gonna we normally skip the weekend we're gonna squ skip Monday as well and then we're gonna do Tuesday and Wednesday and we're gonna be able to finish the wind in the willows um, and then we'll take a little bit of a holiday for a little while um, right now it's kind of getting really busy and stuff like that so I think it'll be good to um, we'll hold back for a little bit but then we'll be back with the virtual neighborhood just like we took a pause before we jumped back in um, we'll be able to do that as well so stay tuned for that um, and I'd love to um, get any recommendations from you if you have any ideas uh, I, I don't promise I'll be able to do all of them but um, if you have any books that are really worth um, something that adults and children can really appreciate together something that um, uh, isn't isn't controversial or anything like that so it can really be a place where um, anyone can feel welcomed in this, uh, um, in this virtual neighborhood. Um, and, and something that is something that is fun, good literature, but it always conveys what is true, good, and beautiful. And it's something that brings us deeper. It's a, it's a deeper kind of story. Just like The Wind in the Willows, if you've noticed, is not merely just a zany story, though it is, but it actually has some very profound um, insights in it um, about who, who we are and who God is and the world that he created. All right, so those are some things to think about, but if you think of any good classics that are out there, um, that would be something that children and adults could, could, um, could be able to read um, and, uh, and something that has a certain depth to it. All right, so here we go. We are now in the further adventures of Mr. Toad, chapter 10. If you remember, he escaped from a dungeon. He, he had stolen a motor car just because he, he became obsessed with it. And he was like, well, I just wanted to see what it looked like and see if it turned on right. And pretty soon he was jumping in and uh, just kind of just took him away. Um, but it took him away to prison. But he finally figured out a way to get out of prison. He's now, um, he was on a rail cart that was, that was uh, um, rescuing him. He was able to get off of that rail train and now finds himself in the middle of the forest. And that's where we are right now. Chapter 10, The Further Adventures of Toad. The front door of the hollow tree faced eastwards. So Toad was called at an early hour partly by the bright sunlight streaming in on him, partly by the exceeding coldness of his toes, which made him dream that he was at home in bed in his own handsome room with a Tudor window on cold winter's night, and his bedclothes had got up, and his bedclothes had got up, grumbling and protesting they couldn't stand the cold any longer, and had run downstairs to the kitchen fire to warm themselves, and he had followed on bare feet along miles and miles of icy stone passages, arguing and beseeching them to be reasonable. He would have probably been aroused much earlier, had he not slept for some weeks on straw over stone flags, almost forgotten, and almost forgotten the friendly feeling of thick blankets pulled well up round the chin. 
Sitting up, he rubbed his eyes first, and his complaining toes next, wondered for a moment where he was, looking round for familiar stone wall and little barred window. Then, with a leap of heart, remember, he remembered everything, his escape, his flight, his pursuit, remembered first and best thing of all that he was free. Free. The word and the thought alone were worth fifty blankets. He was warm from end to end as he thought of the jolly world outside, waiting eagerly for him to make his triumphal entrance, ready to serve him and play up to him, anxious to help him and to keep him company, as it always has been in days of old before misfortune fell upon him. He shook himself and combed the dry leaves out of his hair with his fingers, and his toilet complete marched forth into the comfortable morning sun, cold but confident, hungry but hopeful, all nervous terrors of yesterday dispelled by rest and sleep and frank and heartening sunshine. He had the world all to himself that early summer morning. The dewy woodland, as he threaded it, was solitary and still, green fields that succeeded the trees were his own to do as he liked with. The road itself, when he reached it, in that loneliness was everywhere, seemed like a stray dog looking anxiously for company. Toad, however, was looking for something that could talk, and tell him clearly which way he ought to go. It was all very clear, when you have a light heart and a clear conscience and money in your pocket and Nobody scouring the country for you to drag you off to prison again, to follow where the road beckons and points, not caring whither. The practical toad cared very much indeed, and he could have kicked the road for its helpless silence when every minute was of importance to him. The reserved, rustic road was presently joined by a shy little brother in the shape of a canal, which took its hand and ambled along by its side in perfect confidence but with the same tongue-tied, uncommunicative attitude towards strangers. Bother then, said Toad to himself, but anyhow one thing's clear, they must both be coming from somewhere and going to somewhere. You can't get over that, Toad, my boy. So he marched on patiently by the water's edge. Round a bend in the canal came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward as if in anxious thought. From rope traces attached to his collar stretched a long line, taut, but dipping with his stride, and the further part of it dripping pearly drops. Toad let the horse pass, and stood waiting for what the fates were sending him. With a pleasant swirl of quiet water, at its blunt bow, at its blunt bow, the barge slid up alongside of him, its gaily painted gunwale level with the toad gunwale level with the tow with the towing path, its sole occupant a big stout woman wearing a linen sun bonnet, one brawny arm laid along the tiller. A nice morning, ma'am, she remarked to the toad, as she drew up level with him. I dare say it is, ma'am, responded Toad politely as he walked along the tow path abreast of her. I dare say it is a nice morning to them that's not in sore trouble. It, like what I am. Here is my married daughter. She sends off to me post haste to come to her at once. So off I comes, not knowing what may be happening or going to happen, but fearing the worst, as you will understand, ma'am, if your mother too. And I've left my business to look after itself. I'm in the washing and laundering line, you must know, ma'am, and I've left my young children to look after themselves, and a more mischievous and troublesome set of young imps doesn't exist, and I've lost all my money and lost my way, and as for what may be happening to my married daughter, why, I don't like to think of it, ma'am. Where might your married daughter be living, ma'am? asked the barge woman. Uh, she lives very near to the river, ma'am, replied the toad. Close to a fine house called Toad Hall, that somewheres hereabout in these parts. Perhaps you may have heard of it. Toad Hall? Why, 
I'm going that way myself, replied the barge woman. The canal joins the river some miles further on, a little above Toad Hall. Then it's an easy walk. You come along in the barge with me, and I'll give you a lift. She steered the barge close to the bank, and the toad, with many humble and grateful acknowledgments, stepped lightly on board and sat down with great satisfaction. Toad's luck again, he thought. I always come out on top. So, you're in the washing business, ma'am, said, said the barge woman politely as they glided along. And a very good business you've got to, I dare say, if I'm not making too free in saying so. Finest business in the whole county, said Toad airily. All the gentry come to me. Wouldn't go to anyone else if they were paid. They know me so well. You see, I understand my work thoroughly and attend to it all myself. Washing, ironing, clear starching making up gents' fine shirts for evening wear. Everything's done under my own eye. But surely you don't do all that work yourself, ma'am? Asked the barge woman respectfully. Oh, I have girls, said the toad lightly. Twenty girls are heard thereabouts, always at work. But you know what girls are, ma'am. Nasty little hussies, that's what I call them. So do I, said the barge woman with great heartiness. But I dare say you set yours to rights, the idle trollops. And are you very fond of washing? I love it, said Toad. I simply dote on it. Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash tub. But then it comes so easy to me. No trouble at all, a real pleasure, I assure you, ma'am. What a bit of luck meeting you, observed the barge woman thoughtfully. A regular piece of good fortune for both of us. Oh, why, oh, what do you mean? asked Toad nervously. Well, look at me now, replied the barge woman. I like washing too, just the same as you. And for that matter, whether I like it or not, I've got to do it all my own, naturally, moving about as I do. Now my husband, He's such a fellow for shirking his work and leaving the barge to me that never a moment do I get foreseeing to my own affairs. By rights, he ought to be here now, either steering or tending the horse, though luckily the horse has sense enough to attend to itself. Instead of which, he's gone off with the dog to see if they can't pick up a rabbit for dinner somewhere. He says he'll catch up, but he'll catch me up at the next lock. That's, well, that's as well as may be. I don't trust him. Once he gets off with that dog, who's worse than he is. But meantime, how am I to get on with my washing? Oh, never, never mind about the washing, said Toad, not liking the subject. Try and fix your mind on that rabbit. A nice, fat, young rabbit, I'll be bound. Got any onions? I can't fix my mind on anything but my washing, said the barge woman, and I wonder what, I wonder you can be talking of rabbits with such joyful prospect before you. There's a heap of things of mine that you'll find in a corner of the cabin. If you'll just take one or two of the most necessary sort, I won't venture to describe them to a lady like you, but you'll recognize them at a glance and put them through the wash tub as we go along. Why, it'll be a pleasure to you, as you rightly said, and a real help to me. You'll find a tub handy, and soap, and a kettle on the stove, and a bucket to haul up water from the canal with. Then I shall know you're enjoying yourself, instead of sitting here idle, looking at the scenery and yawning your head off. Here. You let me steer, said Toad, now thoroughly frightened, and then you can get on with your washing your own way. I might spoil your things, or, or not do them as you like. I'm more used to gentlemen's things myself. It's my special line. Let you steer, replied the barge woman, laughing. It takes some practice to steer a barge properly. Besides, it's dull work, and I want you to be happy. No, you shall do the washing you are so fond of, 
and I'll stick to the steering that I understand. Don't try and deprive me of the pleasure of giving you a treat. Toad was fairly cornered. He looked for escape this way and that, saw that he was far too that he was too far from the bank for a flying leap, and sullenly resigned himself to his fate. If it comes to that, he thought in desperation, I suppose any fool can wash. He fetched tub and soap and other necessaries from the cabin, selected a few garments at random, tried to recollect what he had seen in casual glances through laundry windows and set to. A long half hour passed and every minute of it, Toad was getting crosser and crosser. Nothing that he could do to the thing seemed to please them or do them good. He tried coaxing, tried slapping, he tried punching. They smiled back at him out of the tub, unconverted, happy in their original sin. Once or twice he looked nervously over his shoulder at the barge woman, but she appeared to be gazing out in front of her, observed, absorbed in her steering. His, ache, his back ached badly, and he noticed with dismay that his paws were beginning to get all crinkly. Now Toad was very proud of his paws. He muttered under his breath words that should never pass the lips of either washerwoman or Toad's, and lost the soap for the fiftieth time. A burst of laughter made him straighten himself and look round. The barge woman was leaning back and laughing unrestrainedly till the tears ran down her cheeks. I've been watching you all the time, she gasped. I thought you must be a humbug along from the conceited way you talked. Pretty washerwoman you are. Never washed so much as a dish clout in your life, I'll lay. Toad's temper, which had been simmering viciously for some time, now fairly boiled over, and he lost all control of himself. You common, low, fat barge woman, he shouted. Don't you dare talk to your betters like that. Washerwoman indeed. I would have you know that I am a toad, a very well-known, respected, distinguished toad. I may be under a bit of cloud at present, but I will not be laughed at by a barge woman. The woman moved nearer to him, peered under his bonnet keenly and closely. Why, so you are, she cried. Well, I never. A horrid, nasty, crawling toad, and in my nice clean barge too. Now that is a thing that I will not have. She relinquished the tiller for a moment. One big mottled arm shot out and caught the toad by a foreleg, and the other gripped him fast by a hind leg. Then the world turned suddenly upside down. The barge seemed to flit lightly across the sky. The wind whistled in his ears, and Toad found himself flying through the air, revolving rapidly as he went. The water, which he eventually when he eventually reached it with its loud splash, proved quite cold enough for his taste, though its chill was not, su quite su not sufficient to quell his proud spirit, nor shake the heat of his furious temper. He rose to the surface spluttering, and when he had wiped the duckweed out of his eyes, the first thing he saw was the fat barge woman looking back at him over the stern of the retreating barge and laughing. And he vowed, as he coughed and choked, to be even with her. He struck out for the shore, but the cotton gown, the cotton gown greatly impeded his efforts. And when at length he touched land, he found it hard to climb up the steep bank unassisted. He had to take a minute or two's rest to recover his breath. Then gathering his wet skirts well over his arms, he started to run after the barge as fast as his legs would carry wild with indignation, thirsting for revenge. The barge woman was still laughing when he drew up level with her. Put yourself through, your mango washerwoman, she called out, and I'm in your face and crimp it, and you'll pass for a quite decent looking toad. Toad had never paused to reply. Solid revenge was what he wanted, not cheap, windy verbal triumphs, though he had a thing or two in his mind that he would like to say. He saw that he wanted, he saw what he wanted ahead of him. Running swiftly on, he overtook the horse, unfastened the tow rope, and cast off 
jumping, jumped lightly on the horse's bank and urged it to gallop by kipping, kicking it vigorously in the sides. He steered for the open country, abandoning the towpath and swinging his steed down the ruddy lane. Once he looked back and saw that the barge had run aground on the other side of the canal, the barge woman was gesticulating wildly and shouting, Stop! 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 I've heard that song before, said Toad, laughing as he continued to spur his steed onward in its wild career. The barge horse was not capable of a very sustained effort, and its gallop soon subsided into a trot, and its trot into an easy walk. But Toad was quite contented with this, knowing that he at any rate was moving, and the barge was not. He had quite recovered his temper now that he had done something he thought really clever, and he was satisfied to jog along quietly in the sun, taking advantage of any byways and bridle paths, and trying to forget how very long it was since he had a square meal till the canal had been left very far behind him. He had traveled some miles, his horse and he, and he was feeling drowsy in the hot sunshine, when the horse stopped, lowered his head, and began to nibble the grass, and Toad, waking up, just saved himself from falling off by an effort. He looked about and found that he was on a wild common, dotted with patches, patches of gorse and bramble, as far as he could see. Next, near him, stood a dingy gypsy caravan. Beside it, a man was sitting on a bucket turned upside down, very busy smoking and staring into the wild world, into the wide word, world. A fire of sticks was burning nearby, and over the fire hung an iron pot, and out of that pot came forth bubblings and gurglings, and a vague suggestive steaminess. Also smells warm and rich and varied smells, that twine and twisted and wreathed themselves at last into a complete voluptuous, perfect smell that seemed like the very soul of nature taking form and appearing to her children, a true goddess, a mother of solace and comfort. Toad now knew well that he had not been really hungry before. What he had felt earlier in the day had been merely a trifling qualm. This was the real thing at last and no mistake. It would have been dealt with speedily too, or there would be trouble for somebody or something. He looked the gypsy over carefully, wondering vaguely if, he would be, if it would be easier to fight him or conjole him. So there he sat and sniffed and sniffed and looked at the gypsy. And the gypsy sat and smoked and looked at him. Presently, the gypsy took his pipe out of his mouth and remarked in a careless way, Won't you sell me the horse of yours? Toad was completely taken aback. He did not know that gypsies were very fond of horse dealing and never missed an opportunity. And he had not reflected that caravans were always on the move and took a, took a deal of drawing. It had not occurred to him to turn the horse into cash, but the gypsy's su suggestion seemed to smooth the way towards the two things he wanted so badly, ready money and a solid breakfast. What, he said, me sell this beautiful young horse of mine. Oh no, it's out of the question. Who's going to take the washing home to my customers every day? Besides, I'm too fond of him, and simply, he simply dotes on me. I probably should have done that in a washerwoman accent. Try and, try and love a donkey, suggested the gypsy. Some people do. You don't seem to see, continued Toad, that this fine horse of mine is a cut above you already. He's a blood horse. He is partly, not the part you see, of course, another part. And he is a prize hackney too. In his time, that was the time before you knew him, but you can still tell him on, tell it on him at a glance if you understand everything about horses. No, it's not to be thought of for a moment. All the same, how much might you be disposed to offer for offer me for this beautiful young horse of mine? The gypsy looked the horse over, and then he looked Toad over with equal care, and looked at the horse again. Shilling a leg, he said briefly, and turned away, continuing to smoke, and try to stare the wide world out of countenance. Shilling a leg? 
cried Toad. If you please, I must take a little time to work that out and see just what it comes to. He climbed down off his horse and left it to graze and sat down by the gypsy and did sums on his fingers. And at last he said, a shilling a leg? Why, that comes to exactly four shillings and no more. Oh no, I could not think of accepting four shillings for this beautiful young horse of mine. Well, said the gypsy, I'll tell you what I will do. I'll make it five shillings, and that's three and six pence more than the animal's worth, and that's my last word. Then Toad sat and pondered long and deeply, for he was hungry and quite penniless, and still some way. He knew not how far from home and enemies might still be looking for him. To one in such a situation, five shillings may very well appear a large sum of money. On the other hand, it did not seem very much to get for a horse. But then again, the horse hadn't cost him anything. So whatever he got was all clear profit. At last he said firmly, look here, Gypsy, I'll tell you what we do. And this is my last word. You shall hand me over six shillings and six pence, cash down, and further in addition thereto, you shall give me as much breakfast as I can possibly eat at one sitting, of course, out of that iron pot of yours that keeps sending forth such delicious, exciting smells. In return, I make over to you my spirited young horse, with all the beautiful harness and trappings that are on him, freely thrown in. If that's not good enough for you, say so, and I'll be getting on. I know a man near here who's wanted this horse of mine for years. The gypsy grumbled frightfully and declared that if he did a few more deals of that sort, he'd be ruined. But in the end, he lugged a dirty canvas bag out of the depths of his trouser pocket and counted out six shillings and six pence into Toad's paw. Then he disappeared into the caravan for an instant, and returned with a large iron plate and a knife and fork and spoon. He tilted up the pot, and a glorious stream of hot, rich stew gurgled into the plate. It was indeed the most beautiful stew in the world, being made of partridges and pheasants and chickens and hares and rabbits and peahens and guinea fowls, and one or two other things. Toad took the plate on his lap, almost crying, and stopped and stopped and stopped, and kept asking for more, and the gypsy never grudged it to him. He thought that he had never eaten so good a breakfast in all his life. When Toad had taken as much stew on board as he thought he could possibly hold, he got up and said goodbye to the gypsy, and took an affectionate farewell of the horse, and the gypsy who knew the riverside well, gave him directions which way to go, and he sent forth on his tra and sent forth on his travels again in the best possible spirits. He was indeed a very different toad from the animal of an hour ago. The sun was shining brightly, his wet clothes were dry again, he had money in his pocket once more, and was nearing home and friends and safety. And most and best of all, he had a big substantial meal, hot and nourishing. He felt big and strong and careless and self-confident. As he tramped along gaily, he thought of his adventures and, ex and escapes, and how when things seemed at their worst, he had always managed to find a way out, and his pride and conceit began to swell within him. Ho, oh, oh, ho, he said to himself as he marched along with his chin in his air, in his air, his chin in the air, what a clever toad I am. There is surely no animal equal to me for cleverness in the whole world. My enemies shut me up in prison, encircled by sentries, watch night and day by warders. I walk out through them all by sheer ability, coupled with courage. They pursue me with engines and policemen and revolvers. I snap my fingers at them and vanish, laughing into space. I am unfortunately thrown into a canal by a woman fat of body and very evil-minded. What of it? I swim ashore, I seize her horse, I ride off in triumph, and sell the horse for a whole pocket full of money and an excellent breakfast. Ho oh, oh, ho, I am the toad, the handsome, the popular, the successful toad. He got so puffed up with conceit 
that he made up a song as he walked in praise of himself and sang it at the top of his voice, though there was no one to hear but him. It was perhaps the most conceited song that any animal ever composed. And here is his song. The world has held great heroes, as history books have showed, but never a name to go down to fame compared with that of Toad. The clever man at Oxford know all there is to be known, but they none of them know one half as much as intelligent Mr. Toad. The animals sat in the ark and cried, their tears in torrents flowed. Who was it said, there's land ahead, encouraging Mr. Toad? The army all saluted as they marched along the road. Was it the king or the kitchener? No, it was Mr. Toad. The queen and the ladies in waiting sat at the window and sewed. She cried, look, who's that handsome man? They answered, Mr. Toad. There was a great deal more of the same sort, but too dreadfully conceited to be written down. These are some of the milder verses. He sang as he walked, and he walked as he sang and got more inflated every minute. But his pride was shortly to have a, a severe fall. After some miles of country lanes, he reached the high road, and as he turned into it and glanced along its white length, he saw approaching him a speck that turned into a dot, and then into a blob, and then into something very familiar, and a double note of warning only too well known fell on his delighted ear. This is something like, said the excited toad, this is real life again. This is once more the great world from which I have been missed so long. I would hail them my brothers of the wheel and pitch them a yawn of the sort that had been so successful hitherto. And they will give me a lift, of course, and they will and then I will talk to them some more, and perhaps with luck, it may even end in my driving up to Toad Hall in a motor car. That will be one in the eye for Badger. He stepped confidently out into the road to hail the motor car, which came along at an easy pace, slowing down as it neared the lane, when suddenly became very pale. His heart turned to water, his knees shook and yielded under him. And he doubled up and collapsed with a sickening pain in his in his interior as well he might the unhappy animal for the approaching car was the very one he had stolen out of the yard of the red lion hotel on that fateful day when all his troubles began and the people in it were the very same people he had sat and watched at luncheon in the coffee room he sat down in a shabby miserable heap in the road murmuring to himself in his despair, it's all up, it's all over now, chains and policemen again, prison again, and dry bread and water again. Oh, what a fool I have been. What did I want to go strutting about the country for, singing conceited songs and hailing people in the broad day on the high road instead of hiding till nightfall and slipping home quietly by back ways. No oh, hapless toad, oh ill-fated animal! The terrible motor car drew slowly nearer and nearer, till at last he heard it stop just short of him. Two gentlemen got out and walked round the trembling heap of crumpled misery lying in the road, and one of them said, oh dear, this is very sad. Here is a poor thing, a washerwoman apparently who has fainted in the road. Perhaps she is overcome by heat, poor creature. She has not had any food today. Let us lift here into the motor car and take into the nearest village 
where doubtless she has friends. Then tenderly lifted Toad into the motor car and propped him up with soft cushions and proceeded on their way. When Toad heard them talk in so kind and sympath sympathetic a manner, he knew that he was not recognized and his courage began to revive and he cautiously opened first one eye and then the other. Look, said one of the gentlemen, she's better already. The fresh air is doing her good. How do you feel now, ma'am? Uh, thank you kindly, sir, said Toad in a feeble voice. I'm feeling a great deal better now. That's right, said the gentleman. Now keep quite still, and above all, don't try to talk. I won't, said Toad. I was only thinking, if I might sit in the fall seat there beside the driver, where I could get a f the fresh air full in my face, I should be soon all right again. What a very sensible woman, said the gentleman. Of course you shall. So they carefully helped Toad into the front seat beside the driver, and on they went once more. Toad was almost himself again by now. He sat up, looked about him, and tried to beat down the tremors, the yearnings, the old cravings that rose up and beset him and took possession of him entirely. It is fate, he said to himself. Why strive? Why struggle? And he turned to the driver at his side. Please, sir, he said, if you would kindly let me try and drive the car for a little. I have been watching you carefully, and it looks so easy and so interesting and I should like to be able to tell my friends that once I had driven a motor car. The driver laughed at the proposal, so heartily that the gentleman inquired what the matter was. When he heard, he said to Toad's delight, Bravo, man, bravo, ma'am, I like your spirit. Let her have a try and look after her. She won't do any harm. Toad eagerly scrambled into the seat vacated by the driver, took the steering wheel in his hands, listened with affected humility to the instructions given him, and set the car in motion, but very slowly and carefully and for, at first, for he was determined to be prudent. The gentlemen behind clapped their hands and applauded, and Toad heard them saying, how well she, how well she does it. Fancy a washerwoman driving a car as well as that for the first time. Toad went a little faster, then faster still, and faster, he heard the gentleman call out warningly, Be careful, washerwoman. And this annoyed him, and he began to lose his head. The driver tried to interfere, but he pinned him down in his seat with one elbow and put on full speed. The rush of air in his face, the hum of the engine, and the light jump of the car beneath him intoxicated his weak brain. Washerwoman indeed, he shouted recklessly. Ho, ho, I am the toad, the motor car snatcher the prison breaker, the toad who always escapes. Sit still and you shall know what driving really is, for you are in the hands of the famous, the skillful, the entirely fearless toad. With a cry of horror, the whole party flung themselves on him. Seize him, they cried, seize the toad, the wicked animal who stole a motor car. Bind him, chain him, drag him to the nearest police station. Down, down with a desperate and dangerous toad. Alas, they should have thought they ought to have been more prudent, that they should remember, they should have remembered to stop the motor car somehow before playing any pranks on that sort. With a half turn of the wheel, the toad sent the car crashing through the low hedge that ran along the roadside. One mighty bound, a violent shock, and the wheels of the car were churning up thick mud in a horse pond. Toad found himself flying through the air with a strong rush and delicate curve of a swallow. He liked the motion and was just beginning to wonder whether it would go on until he developed wings and turned into a toad bird when he landed on his back with a thump in a soft, rich grass of a meadow. Sitting up, he could just see the motor car in the pond and nearly submerged. The gentleman and the driver, encumbered by their long coats, were floundering helplessly in the water. He picked himself up rapidly and set off running across country as hard as he could, scrambling through hedges, jumping ditches, pounding across fields till he was breathless and weary. 
and he had to settle down into an easy walk. When he had recovered his breath somewhat and was able to think calmly, he began to giggle. And from giggling, he took to laughing, and he laughed till he had to sit down under a hedge. Ho, ho, he cried in ecstasies of self-admiration. Toad again, Toad as usual, comes out on top. Who was it got them to give him a lift? Who managed to get on the front seat for the sake of fresh air? Who persuaded them to let in, to, into letting him see if he could drive? Who landed them all in a horse pond? Who escaped? Fly, flying gaily and unscathed through the air, leaving the narrow-minded, grudging, timid excursionists in the mud where they should rightly be. Why, Toad, of course. Clever Toad, great Toad, good Toad. Then he burst into song again and chanted with, un, with uplifted voice. The motor car went poop, poop, poop as it raced along the road. Who was it steered it into the pond, ingenious Mr. Toad? How clever I am! How clever, how clever, how clever! A slight noise at a distance behind him made him turn his head and look. Oh, horror! Oh, misery! Oh, despair! About two fields off, a chauffeur in his leather gaiters and a and two large rural policemen were visible, running towards him as hard as they could. Poor Toad sprang to his feet and pelted away again, his heart in his mouth. Oh my, he gasped as he panted along. What an ass I've been! What a conceited and heedless ass! Swaggering again, shouting and singing songs again, sitting still and gassing again. Oh my, oh my, oh my! He glanced back and saw this to his dismay that they were gaining on him. On he ran desperately, but kept looking back and saw that they were still gaining steadily. He did his best, but he was a fat animal, and his legs were short, and still they gained. He could hear them close behind him now. Ceasing to heed where he was going, he struggled on blindly and wildly, looking back over his shoulder at the now triumphant enemy, when suddenly the earth failed under his feet, and he grasped at the air, and splash! He found himself head over heels in deep water, rapid water, water that bore him along with a force that could not, he could not contend with. And he knew that in his blind panic, he had run straight into the river. He rose to the surface and tried to get, grasp the reeds and the rushes that grew along the water's edge close under the bank. But the stream was so strong that it tore them out of his hands. Oh my, gasped. Poor Toad, if I ever steal a motor call again, if I ever sing another conceited song. Then down he went and came up breathless and spluttering. Presently he saw that he was approaching a big dark hole in the bank, just above his head. As the stream bore him past, he reached up with a paw and caught hold of the edge and held on. Then slowly and with difficulty, it's true, he drew himself out of the water, till at last he was able to rest his elbows on the edge of the hole. There he remained for some minutes, puffing and panting, for he was quite exhausted. As he sighed and blew and stared before him and stared before him into the dark hole, some bright small thing shone and twinkled in its depths, moving towards him. As it approached, a face grew up gradually around it, and it was a familiar face, brown and small with whiskers, grave and round, with neat ears and silky hair. It was Water Rat. And that is the end of this chapter. Next chapter is called Like Summer Tempests Came His Tears. So we have two more chapters. We're going to do those Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we're going to finish this season of the virtual neighborhood. So this is a great, just a very funny one here. But it deals with the whole thing of pride. And that whole thing of uh, he is very conceited. He's singing the song about how great he is, how wise he is, but there's an expression that pride comes before the fall. And we can think of Lucifer himself in total pride and total conceitment, and yet he was cast down from heaven. So a good thing to think about there, that if you want just a good thing to humble you, 
um, because all of us can struggle with pride in some sort of way. That's a lot of times, that's the deepest, deepest area of, of weakness, of sin that, that we struggle with. And a lot of times we're blind to pride. And so we always have to ask the Lord to humble us. And sometimes he'll allow different things to happen in our, in our life to help us realize that there is a God and it's not us. And so those moments in which we, we stumble, we fall, that they can be moments where God can use them to say, hold on to me and grow in strength and humility in me and not in yourself. So something to think about there. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May the Lord bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, God bless you, and have a nice weekend as well.